this year in America, there are going to be 300,000 children who receive presents from their incarcerated parents, usually fathers. Mm -hmm. And there are <clears throat> thousands, <clears throat> excuse me, thousands of churches in the country who will cooperate in the doing of this. And what this means to us as a church is that we get to be a blessing to children who may or may not otherwise even have Christmas right. if it isn't for the presents that we would that we would give them. And we've been doing this for a number of years. People have seen the, the trees and the mm -hmm. little angels, you know. Yes. And so this year, um, we are going to be uh, looking for 51 yes. uh, individuals or families mm -hmm. that want to take on a family. a family, so it would be, would be a, a single child all the way up to one has like six yes. kids, right? If a person, and we need 51 champions for this one, yes. right? And that 51 translates out to how many kids total? 112. 112, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. So 51 individuals or families who will take on a family yes. and how, if they want to do this, because our church excels at this, mm -hmm. how can they participate. They call me and I will give them all the info they want and more to be able to take care of this. Yeah. And we'll have the information ready for them to go and children's names and so on. Okay. We'll lay it out all, all, all out for them. All right. Yeah. Thanks for choosing to be with us today. Uh, we're glad that you made the effort uh, to seek us out and find us online. We know that this is a, a different uh, day, a different opportunity for us to engage with you, but we're glad that you found us. Um, and actually, um, we know that there are all sorts of different ways that our families are engaging with us when we move to online. Um, some of them have everybody get up and shower and get dressed as if they're going down to church. And I know you've heard of some other things that people do. Well, we stay in our jammies, get a cup of coffee, sit down on the couch, and then we enjoy sh worship. Yeah, well, whatever it is, we know that all, every different family has a different dynamic, um, but you chose to be with us today, and we wanted to read a passage of scripture today uh, that we hope encourages you as we move into our service today. Listen to what King David says. He says in Psalm 119, let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant for I do not forget your commandments. I love this passage and Christy and I wanted to share it with you today because you can just see the, the, the honesty and the sincerity and the dependence that David has on the Lord. And through it all, through those times of, of longing for the Lord's help, he chooses 
to submit himself to the will and the way of his heavenly father. Yeah, and he knows exactly what he needs, even in the midst of troubles. And so I hope today, as we walk into worship and a few songs, that you will choose to worship with us. That you will sit there and sing, stand up and sing, have a little dance party, um, do whatever it is your family does, but choose to worship with us today. I have 
have a hope, I have a future, I have a destiny that is yet awaiting me. My life's not over, a new beginning's just begun. I have a hope, I have this hope. God has a plan, it's not too hard. Amongst all the stuff that we are feeling like we're losing, things that um, have shut us down, that make us feel like we've lost uh, some of our freedom, some of our things, yet we still have this hope. And I, I, I can't say it more, but that's a song that just encourages me. I agree, Christy. That's a, a great point. Um, is 
even though we all know that we're on this little weird pause, we're in this freeze for two weeks, it is encouraging to know that one thing that never goes on pause is hope because it's a choice, right? There's intentionality to say, you know what? Hope isn't just a destination that I'll get to someday. It's a disposition of the heart that we can choose to have. And when we sing about it and when we declare it, it actually kind of um, affects how we see the world and how we engage people. Yeah, brings smile to your face, makes you go outside and say, I'm okay, it's okay, everything's going to be okay. That's right. So let's continue on with that spirit of worship.
Oh God, just so great to be able to stand here and say, I will put my trust in you and will not be shaken. And know with every confidence that it is true because you are the almighty savior. And no matter we want where we want to place our trust or our eyes on situations, on things that we think can help us out, Lord, you, you are that life giver, that true help. And these, these words this week have just been so nurturing for my soul and healing for my heart, knowing that when the enemy wants to come against me, I can sing your praises. And when the darkness comes, I can sing your praises. And because of singing your praises and remembering your faithfulness and your amazingness and your power, because my eyes are on you, because I'm praising you, I can stand and do it with joy, even in my suffering with joy, because my eyes are on you. And it is that choice, Lord. And so I just pray that this week, God, you will help us to choose to worship, to choose to have our eyes on you, no matter the situation, no matter the circumstances. God, we love you and we are so, so grateful and so full of praises for your greatness. Almighty Father, we, we love you. And it's in your son's name, amen. So Christy, when I bring up the word evangelism to you, what, can, what does that make you feel uh, when, I, when I use that term with you? It stresses me out slightly, um, raises my blood pressure slightly, um, and then makes me want to think, where is Billy Graham? Okay, that's a great one. Oftentimes, uh, when, when we encourage people uh, to evangelize and share their faith, it, it creates all that tension and anxiety in people uh, because they feel that maybe they don't know enough. What if I get asked a question I don't know the answer to? Or maybe it's not my, my spiritual gift and I need to leave that gift to the Billy Grahams or the Reed Saunders of the world, right? Evangelism can be a scary thing. It can. And, and yet, I think when we learn that it's not that scary and that you can have a conversation with somebody, it um, can completely change your thought on when somebody says that. Yeah, absolutely. And today, Pastor Tyler is going to continue on from Colossians, and he's going to share with us, um, not necessarily in how to on, on 10 tips on how to lead someone to Christ, but he's going to talk to us about a posture, um, an attitude that we can bring to this calling that we have been given by God to, to share the gospel with all people um, in all places at all times. So um, as Tyler opens the word for us today. I hope that you are encouraged and that you will see the posture that we ought to take as we engage our culture. We are in the letter of Colossians, which we've been in for a few weeks in our series called Against the Tide. So if you have your Bible, please turn in it to Colossians 4. And while you're turning there, let me take us back to where we've been and then I'll tell you where we're going. The letter of Colossians has largely been Paul addressing the new responsibilities of this new community and the new privileges of being a believer. And so last week, Mark took us through something very practical where Paul says, what you do now, the decisions you make as a parent, as a child, as an employer, directly will affect your future. God will re reward good decisions or bad decisions lead to a poor outcome. So along that same vein, of practical living, Paul comes to the end of this letter, he's almost done, and he says, I've got a way that I want you to behave to those outside the church. He calls them outsiders or non-believers. There's a way that you need to approach them so that the gospel is unhindered. So before we get into this, here's my question, and you were teased with this a second ago with Jeff and Christy. Does the word evangelism or witnessing or sharing your faith cause you anxiety? Does, does that idea make you want to stop and go, ah, that's not my gifting. I don't really like doing that. That's for other people. Can I gently suggest that if that's how you feel, you are missing a step in evangelism that Paul wants to teach you so that the idea of sharing your faith not only isn't scary, you actually approach it with power and confidence and expect a greater outcome. I, I want to suggest again gently that if you're afraid of evangelism or witnessing, you're actually missing a very powerful step. So that's where Paul wants to take us. But before he says, hey, here's how you evangelize, here's how you witness, he says, I want to teach you something else first. 
So I'm going to read the passage with, with us really quick. It's going to be on the screen, and then we'll jump into the message. Colossians 4, verses 2 through 6. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders or non-believers. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So again, let's frame this. He wants to get you to the idea of dealing and being in conversation with non-Christians. But before he does that, he says, let me pull you this way. I need to teach you how to pray. Because if you are not praying well, evangelism doesn't come out well. So he says, let's learn how to pray first. So your and my prayer devoted life should be marked by two things. Here's the first one. He says, be watchful. What does that mean? We are watchful over or alert to things that we care about. Parents are watchful of their children. They are aware of the dangers approaching their kids. Teachers are aware of the dangers and pitfalls approaching their students. Pastors are aware of the dangers approaching the flock or the body of Christ. When we look at the things that we are responsible for or care about, we are watchful of them. And we take steps to make sure that those are protected. But notice, in this passage of Scripture, he doesn't say, be watchful and act. There are passages like that, but he says, be watchful and pray. So what is he trying to get you to understand? Remember where we're going. We're going to witnessing. So he says, before we go there, you need to understand, you need to pray in a way that attaches you to God. Being watchful and praying means you are looking at your life and you're going, God, I can't handle all of this and I need your help. When you're watchful over your kids, here's what you're saying. Here's the question. I don't know what to do with my son. He is angry. He's rebellious. I don't know what to do with my daughter. She's got friends that I know aren't good for. I don't know what to do. You're looking at your business and you're going, I have huge decisions to make that affect dozens, of, if not hundreds of people, and I don't know what to do. And God's going, I do. I know what to do. In your prayers, be watchful over what you're responsible for, but ask me for wisdom and for discernment. So for the Christian, for you, for me, our greatest decision-making abilities happen in prayer as we attach ourselves in dependence to God. See, the believer prays him and herself into dependence. So there's watchfulness, but then he says, thankfulness should mark your prayer. Thankfulness has in itself a power to destroy pride. That's why he wants it defining your prayer life. Prideful people care nothing for evangelism because prideful people only care about themselves. Pride says, I'm the most important. Pride says, I create. Pride says, I did this. Pride says, and most lethally, I am owed. I am entitled. Therefore, I, I need good, I am owed good things in my life. And so Paul says, in your prayers, mark your life with thankfulness. Because when you do this, it says a different message. What I have, I didn't create. What I have, I didn't give myself. When you pray in thankfulness, you're saying, I look at my life as a series of gifts. And if you look at your life as a series of gifts, you will approach life and people in witnessing differently. Let me give, an, give you an example. If your life is a series of gifts, then whether they're good or bad, you recognize their ability to make you a better person. James, the brother of Jesus, says this. He says, all good and perfect things come from God. So be thankful. But he says that in the context of trials and suffering. So regardless of what you and me are going through right now, he says, these are gifts. Life is a gift. Your wife, she's a gift. Your kids, they're a gift. Your job is a gift. This season of waiting, it's a gift. So in your prayers, the devoted praying believer prays themselves into a dependence on God, alert to what is coming and praying for answers and being thankful for what you are given. Your prayer life as a believer functions to humble you and me. 
Your prayer life functions to humble you. And that is absolutely necessary if we're ever going to reach people. If you are ever going to evangelize powerfully, your prayer life must be steeped in dependence. And so after Paul has brought you to this place, brought me to this place, where we understand prayer in dependence on God, he moves you to a second place. And he says, can, can I ask a favor? He's, he's asking the church. He's like, pause. Now that I've taught you how to pray, can I ask you something? Will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? And he prays, in my opinion, two of the weirdest things, seeing as it's Paul. He says, pray for opportunity for me and pray for clarity of the gospel. Now, on a surface level reading of this text, you're like, well, that, that makes sense. I mean, this is the gospel. We, we want opportunity for it and we want it to be clear. But it's weird because Paul says it and you have to grab that opportunity. This is the most notable missionary on planet earth up to this point. And he's praying, would, you, would God give me opportunity? Why is that weird? Because Paul was the guy training the church how to share the gospel. Why is he praying for opportunity? You'd think he'd be pretty good at this. What does that teach you he believes about the gospel and evangelism? teaches you and it teaches me that he believes even in the act of sharing the gospel the opportunity to do so is a gift and where do gifts come from somebody else so even in our mandate to share the gospel and we are mandated so if you're if you're pulling yourself aside and you're like ah, this still isn't me no mark 16 you are mandated to share your faith but even in the mandate even in the mandate to share the gospel paul's going opportunities are given by God. This is important because you and me have to understand this. I think part of the reason we're afraid of witnessing and evangelism, some of us, is because we think it's all on us. We think that our message needs to be completely clear. We need to be overly convincing. We need to know all the answers. We need to be prepared for anything. And what Paul is trying to teach us, as gently as he can, is that even the opportunity to share is God-given. Think about this. Paul over anyone would understand that the non-believing individual isn't dumb. Paul wasn't dumb. They're deceived. The non-believing individual, your friends, your family, your parents, they're not dumb. They're deceived if they're not believers. You are not praying for great arguments. You are praying against the movements of Satan. You are praying for the entrapped blind hearts of people. See, he says, God, please open a door for me. That's the door of the human heart. And I'm sorry, friends, there's no battering ram on planet Earth big enough to knock the door down of a human heart. There's none. You and me have to learn how to pray and just get out of the way and let God break the door down. But that should give you a sense of relief. Let's breathe for a second. If it is indeed God that breaks the door down, think about this, then God is in control of and responsible for every step along the salvation process. Was he responsible for you being saved? Yes. Was he responsible for opening the door to somebody else's heart? Yes. Was he responsible for then saving them? Yes. See, here's what Paul's getting at with opportunities. Even in our mandate to share the gospel, God wants you to know that every step along the salvation line and journey is designed to give him glory, not me, not you. So Paul says, please pray that I would have opportunities. Please pray that I would have moments with people. Please pray that I would have chance encounters with people. And we know that he believed this. We know that he's been praying this probably his entire Christian life. Because when he wrote his previous letters to Galatians, Ephesians, he was in prison. Yes, you remember this? His first imprisonment, He's writing all these letters to the churches, and he says the same thing in each one. Hey, I've heard that you now know that I'm in prison. Don't freak out. I've heard that you now know I'm in prison. Don't be scared. And I, I imagine he would almost laugh when he said this. He's like, think about where I am, friends. Yes, I'm in jail, and that's kind of scary. But think about the guard. He is legally obligated to stay right by me. He's not leaving. So I'm sharing the gospel with him. Guards are coming to Christ. Other prisoners are coming to Christ. He then went through the court system and made his way to Caesar and pleaded his case and shared the gospel with him. See, 
if me and you are legitimately praying for opportunities, then even in perceived negative circumstances, that's an opportunity. Don't miss those. Paul didn't miss them. And he's praying, I think, to notify you that we need to be praying this way. So he says, pray for opportunities. He then says, pray for clarity of the gospel, which again, for Paul, makes absolutely no sense, in my, in my opinion, when you, when you surface level read this. This is the guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He was the preacher that was teaching other pastors. He goes out and he rebukes Peter and Timothy, followers of Jesus, that were leading other churches. He rebukes both of them. In Galatians 2, he says to Peter, Peter, stop telling Gentiles to behave like Jews. What was Peter doing? He was taking the gospel and he was adding to it. It was the gospel and the gospel plus. He was saying, become a Christian, follow Jesus, but then don't eat this or eat this or don't go to the temple or, or go to the temple. Don't buy your meat here. And, and Paul's going, you're... You are clouding the gospel, Peter. Stop. So not only did he rebuke him, but his rebuke ends up in scripture. So I feel kind of bad for Peter because for eternity, we have to be, he has to be reminded that he messed up. But he also says this to Timothy. In another rebuke, he says, Timothy, don't be embarrassed of this message. Don't be embarrassed of the gospel. I know it seemingly looks defeatist to say that God is all powerful, but then came to earth and died. But that's the power of the gospel. Don't rob the gospel of that moment. Don't rob the cross of its power. Do you want to know why I think Paul's praying for clarity? It's not because he doesn't understand the gospel. He taught everyone how to share the gospel. I think the reason that he prays this is because he has the same fear that me and you do. That sometimes deep down, we think that the gospel is not enough. There's got to be more than just believing in Jesus, right? That's too easy. We as human beings complicate this all the time. You know this because look at all of the other major religions. I don't mean to pick on other faiths while there's no representation here, but you just go research them. What do Catholicism, Islam, Jehovah's Witness, Mormonism, what do all of them have in common in terms of salvation? Every single one of them is faith, and works. Why do we as human beings love to add to the gospel? Because we like to have a say in how we're saved. We like to gain some of the credit. We like to take some of the glory. Even if we don't verbalize it like that, we like to have control. Yes, I'm saved, but I've also done a lot of good things. But there's a reason that the Bible says you are saved by faith alone and not by works. So what? So that you can't boast. Paul says, please pray for me. He's praying this for himself, but I think for everybody, that the gospel would be simple and clear because if it's not, that's not the gospel. It's not the gospel and the gospel plus. What, so ask yourself this question. When and where are you tempted to add to the gospel? When are you tempted to say, okay, it's faith, but then also change these behaviors? No, 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 it's just the gospel. What about when you're in a, a very intellectual environment? We're, we're in first world America. There's a lot of very intelligent people. You might work with a bunch of them. And to come into that intelligent environment and say that there is a God, that, he, that his son died and then rose again, that can seem foolish. And so what do, we, what do we like to do to the gospel? We like to take that story, but then we add proof. No, no, no. We've proven this story in the Bible, so the Bible is true, therefore you have to believe. No, they don't. See, this story of adding to the gospel is very old. Something we're dealing with, but something the early church was dealing with. Paul in the Corinthian church says this. He says the Jews in the area were demanding signs and the Greeks wanted philosophy. But we Christians preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jew and foolishness to the Greek. Both the Jew and the Greek wanted more. The gospel wasn't enough to them. It was foolish. To the Greek, they were like, why would I believe in, in, a, in a guy that died? That doesn't make any sense. And the Jew would say, I want more. I want more of a miracle. I want more supernatural proof. No, there's nothing more. God is real. He sent Jesus to earth in the form of a man to live a perfect life and to die for our sins. We need to reckon with what's in here. 
and he rose again so that we could be in heaven forever with God. That's the gospel. Don't add anything. Now you might be going, well, hold on. Are we never supposed to practice apologetics or good arguments? Are we never supposed to look at how to enhance our witness? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the gospel is simple. And when you add things to it, it diminishes the power of the cross. Paul even goes so far as to say this. He said, when I preach, I minimize eloquent speech so that nobody can take anything away from the cross. That would be like me saying that I kind of want to botch this sermon so that people can go, man, Tyler really messed that one up. But a lot of people came to Jesus. Don't worry, I'm not going to do that. But Paul says this. He says, I limit eloquent speech so that the cross has even more power. But that's what we're afraid of. And maybe this is where you need to pause the sermon and you just need to think, where am I tempted to add things to the gospel? Where am I tempted to add some research or, or evidence in a way? Or where am I tempted to add, um, to add proof or, or add works? If the gospel scares you in its simplicity, that's a good thing. Because what Jesus wanted you to know, what Paul wants you to know, is that in the simplicity of the gospel, there's power. Because if you add anything, what you're saying is, Jesus, what you did wasn't enough. I'm going to help you. He doesn't need any help. See, the believer's message is steeped in dependence. We, we pull ourselves into dependence with prayer. That's the first movement. Second movement, even our attempt to witness is steeped in dependence. But more than that, he says, okay, I've taught you how to pray. Here's the motivation. Now let's go do it. So here's your question, right? Here's where you wanted, what you wanted to know from the beginning. How do I share this message? Paul actually keeps it very simple. He looks at you and me and he says, to the outsider, to the non-Christian, be wise. That's it. He says, be wise. If you want to understand how to reach them, be wise. And you're like, okay, I don't know what that means. Tell me more. He says, here's two things. Be wise means this. Number one, he says, make the most of every opportunity. If movement two, remember what he said. He said, I'm praying that, you, that God would give me opportunity. If you and me are legitimately praying for opportunity to share the gospel, should we not expect it? He says, the first way to live wise is to recognize that in this cosmic story of God saving us, God wants you involved. Don't miss the moments. Sometimes they're glaring. Like I was working at the courthouse one time and, and one of my coworkers, she comes and she stands next to me and we're folding towels. And she goes, Tyler, do you believe in angels and demons? Like, what do you think about that spiritual stuff? Opportunity. Or if someone in your office understand, they know that you're a Christian and they ask you about your church. Opportunity. Don't miss those. Here's really the only question you need to ask. If given an opportunity by somebody else, can you articulate your story? Not do you have all the answers to Scripture's questions. Do you know your story? Do you know the difference that Jesus makes in your life? If you became a Christian later in life, that's actually fairly easy for you. Because you look at your life and you're like, pre-Jesus, pre me, was mean, rude, selfish, treated people like garbage, cared for no one but me. But after receiving Jesus, my language is different. What I care about is different. I, I go to church now. I live for other people. So it's fairly easy. But if you've grown up in church and you became a Christian at five, it is a little harder, but the question still stands. In what way does knowing Jesus shape your life now? How does it shape your decision making? How does it shape your emotions? Are you given to emotions? Or do they simply serve to point you back to God? When you look at your life, what difference does Jesus make? And be able to have those conversations. And here's where you move to the second part. How do you be wise with people? The first thing is you don't miss an opportunity. Be ready for it. And number two, Paul says your conversations should be defined by two things. The first one is grace. The second one is salt. And you're like, that doesn't make any sense. I'll explain that in a second. Grace. What is grace? Grace is a space to turn around in the relationship. Grace is something that we receive that we don't deserve. See, the Bible says that while you were still a sinner, 
while you were arrogant, while you were mean, while you rejected God, even in that space, God came in and invaded your life and rescued you. You did not deserve that. I didn't deserve that. So if indeed that's real, why would we not extend that to other people? Now, here, here's where the rubber meets the road, though. Here's why this is so difficult. There are people whose life decisions you vehemently disagree with. And so I just want to ask you, here's a little test. When you look at other people's political decisions, how easy is it for you to talk to those people? I mean, I kind of hope that that's stung a little bit. I'm not saying that you need to be obsessed with politics. That's not my point. But if you find yourself unbelievably enraged at politics or the election and you can't even talk to people, might I suggest that you then have no business talking about sin and talking about the gospel? Because if we can't engage with people even on a political level and give grace enough for someone to potentially change an opinion, if we can't do that, then how are we ever going to do it with the gospel? Or let's take another hot button issue. Let's take abortion. And you're talking with someone that vehemently disagrees with your point of view, but you cannot find it in yourself to be gentle in your conversation. If you can't, might I gently suggest that the gospel and its delivery is going to be very difficult for you. Grace is a softness. It's a gentleness. It's a kindness. And scripture says it wasn't God's perfect logic that brought you to repentance. What does it say? It says it was his kindness that leads you and me to repentance. So if God treated you and me that way, then should we not treat other people that way? in our presentation of our story in the gospel. He also says, let it be full of grace. Let it be full of salt. What is salt? Paul and his, and his audience would have understood that salt is a preservative. So he says, I want your conversation steeped in this, meaning I want you to preserve people. If your goal is to go in and shred someone with an argument, if you're coming in with your Bible-thumping club, you have done nothing except for maybe help them throw up more walls between them and the gospel. But if salt genuinely preserves and our words preserve, that means you go in with the sole goal to protect and win that person's heart. Ravi Zacharias used to say, there's an old Indian proverb, and he said, don't go and cut off someone's nose and then ask them to smell a rose. Don't cut off their nose and then ask them to smell a rose. That means you don't go in and shred someone's belief system and their, their family system that's been with them for decades, years and years and years, and then after you've shredded them, go, hey, Jesus is nice. See, if they're not safe with you, then why on earth would they be safe with your God? That's what they're asking themselves. If people aren't safe with you, one of their first windows into the heart of God, then why would they be safe with God? See, first movement, you pray yourself into dependence and you don't leave your knees until you are fully dependent on God. You don't go into conversations unless you go knowing, I, everything I have is from you and I don't want to move until me and you are in step. That's the first movement. Second movement is you pray repeatedly for opportunities, not, not just that someone would get saved, but opportunities for you to share and clarity of the gospel that you wouldn't add anything because it's a supernatural event. Let it be a supernatural event. And then the third movement is that you would go and not miss opportunities by sharing your story, by sharing Jesus with people with grace and with salt. See, witnessing doesn't, it's not just the conversation with people. There's two steps before it. Have you been praying yourself into a position where you're ready? And then are you praying for opportunities and clarity? Then you go share. So wherever you're at, work yourself through that pattern. Get me and God on the same page. Pray for opportunities so that this moment is supernatural and not just you being convincing. And then go share. Because a prayerful dependence leads to a gracious invitation. And that's when people turn. Give them space enough to turn so that they're safe with you. Let's pray. Father, evangelism, even for me, has often been a very scary thought. Because I've bought the lie that evangelism is all on me. 
that I need to have all the answers, that I need to be prepped, that I can't ever be stumped. And that's not evangelism. That's, that's me trying to, to win arguments, not people. So for anyone that's in that space, God, would you humble us? Just put us back on our knees in prayer with you. And then would, all, would, would everybody else, would all of us be praying for the friends and the family in our life that don't know you? That you, God, would open the door. That you would knock the walls down because only you can do that. And would we be faithful then to share the gospel? I thank you for your word. I thank you for Paul and his obedience to, to write this message. Would we go forth excited about the people we have the privilege and the opportunity of witnessing to? Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Well, now we have an opportunity to do something a little bit different. Um, we have a few questions that we would like uh, you to engage with. Questions that come out of the sermon. We are constantly looking for ways to, to connect with you and to make sure that the, the scriptures connect with you and your heart. Um, so what we've done is we've come up with a few questions that we want you to engage, maybe personally, maybe you'll sit together as a, as a family and you'll work through these. Some of these questions really might jump out at you and really um, uh, encourage you. Some of them might convict you. Um, and what we hope more than anything is that it allows you to connect yourself personally to this text um, in an in a intimate, personal way. So let me share some of these questions with you. The first one is, who in your life do you need to pray for opportunities to reach? The second, if the opportunities came, would you be ready? Can you articulate your testimony? What dominates your prayer life now? What are your conversations with non-believers like? How would you like to do it differently? I hope as you engage in those questions, think through those questions, maybe it's not just today, maybe it's this week. Um, let God um, help you as you try to find those answers. Yeah, and he will. And it's one of the beautiful things about community is as each one of us are individually wrestling with this text and wrestling with these questions, uh, we know that there's others that have been asked the same questions. And as we gather and as we uh, find opportunities to assemble, uh, we can work through them and maybe share some of our answers and share the growth that the Spirit has created in us um, as we have looked at his word, as we've spent time in worship, and as we've shared this time together.